Hey folks, Justin here. So I know you're probably expecting a video in this section, but John's pretty old school and requested that this interview be done via telephone. So unfortunately there is no video, though I'm sure you'll still enjoy listening. Anyways, no worries. Video will return with the next episode. Anyway, here you go. All right, folks, welcome to the Monsters, Madness, and Magic Podcast. I'm your host, Justin, here with a quick word before we dive in. Now, in this episode, I chat with musician John Oliva about the early years of Sabotage, the legacy of Chris Oliva, substance abuse, rehab, Halloween, haunted recording studios, Trans Siberian Orchestra, and more. As always, thank you for listening, and if you'd like to help the show grow, please leave us a review wherever you're listening to the podcast. Anyway, without further ado, here you go. and ghouls. This is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature, one overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. Take us back in time. You're a youngster. Are you a book reader, fort builder, troublemaker, or all the above? <laughs> troublemaker, for <laughs> sure. That, that was an easy one, man. <laughs> what kind of trouble are we talking? You knocking mailboxes off of poles, cherry oh, bombs? Oh, you <laughs> name it. You name it. Egging houses, toilet papering houses on Halloween, and there's all kinds of uh, adolescent nonsense. Were you a big fan of Halloween growing up as a kid then? Oh, yeah, big time. Whereabouts did you grow up? Oakland, New Jersey. We moved to California in uh, when I was uh, 12 or 13. And then we moved, uh, we lived in California for like four years. And then we moved here to Florida, where I have been ever since. What was the reason for the move out of California? My father's work. Yeah, he got transferred. So we ended up in uh, Escondido, California. Were either your parents, were they musically inclined at all? Yeah, well, my dad was a concert pianist when he was young, and then was a, he played, actually, he played at Lawrence Welk's golf course place in California. We all actually got jobs there, worked there. I was a cart boy. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you say, uh, let's say, uh, back in your house growing up, what sort of records would be spinning around the house? What are some formative uh, records that you remember? Oh, definitely the Beatles. That was the biggest thing because, uh, you know, we were young. And I actually saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show when I was like four or five. And I immediately asked my parents for a drum set and they got me one. And I started playing drums when I was like five or six. And uh, it just went on from there. But we, we you know, I, I, I used to steal my sister's Beatle records all the time. But, but then, you know, all the other music started coming in. I remember... Uh, Let's see, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Chicago, you know, the, the Stones, obviously, the Kinks, 
you know, all kinds of stuff. Mainly British bands, though. And now, when I was uh, when I was thirteen, I got introduced to Black Sabbath, and my life changed from that day on. <laughs> so, how long after that did you pick up an instrument, or were you already playing around with instruments? I was already messing around with drums and a little guitar, but I was ch- tough for me because I'm left-handed. And back in those days, you really couldn't get a left-handed guitar. You had to have them specifically made for you. And they were very expensive. So I played upside down. You know, I didn't change the strings around. So, you know, I was limited at what I could do on guitar for a while until I could get a whole, my hands on a left-handed. But I started playing piano. My dad started teaching me piano, you know, and then it just went on. I, you know, the very first concert I saw was Black Sabbath. California Jam 1, I think it was in 75. Mm. But I got to see Sabbath, Deep Purple, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. They, everybody was there that played that. It was great. What about formative films and TV shows you grew up on? What comes to mind? <laughs> Batman. Um, <laughs> A Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. That was one of my favorites. Twilight Zone. I like Twilight Zone a lot. The Outer Limits. Mm, mm, mm. I love the outer. I like sci-fi stuff. You know, I'm very into that. So uh, that was mainly that was main main stuff I liked. But I I thought Batman was hysterical. <laughs> you know the the the, the, the series with with uh, what's his name um Adam West right yeah and Burt Ward I, and I I loved the uh, villains they had. You know the Joker, the Penguin, those guys like that. It was funny. So do you consider yourself a comic kid growing up? Oh yeah, I had tons of comic books. You still got any of them? No, unfortunately, <laughs> I don't. Uh, I know, it's stupid. They'd probably be worth a lot of money now. Right. And you mentioned uh, Twilight Zone. Did you ever watch uh, Rod Sterling's other show? It was The Night Gallery. That was kind of Twilight. Night Gallery, yeah. yes. Another one I watched a lot, too. Yeah, man, there were so many TV shows back then. That I loved, and I loved some of the comedy, the sitcoms, like Get Smart. I loved it, Get mm. Smart. Uh, Hogan's Heroes. Classic. You know, classic and um but i really you know i really wasn't those were the shows i mainly watched but i didn't watch tv all the time right i wasn't really like a, a tv head well john this is something i like to ask everyone just because you never know uh what scared you as a kid the wolf man mm, uh, right there with you top of my list yeah uh, top of my list when i first saw the original wolf, wolf man with Lon cheney jr i couldn't sleep for a week <laughs> I was terrified. Uh, yeah, it was so weird. But I was, I was a kid. I was young. But he, that scared me. Right. And even to this day, you know, a good werewolf movie is they're very few and far between. You know. Yeah, that's true. But nothing like the the Lon Chaney Jr. as as the Wolfman. There's been a lot of Wolfman movies, but nothing like that. So I wanted to ask you about when you read your bio, there's that uh, that block party referenced about uh, you and your brother Chris playing covers in the street there. What's the story behind that? <laughs> well, that's how we got started. Uh, before we started doing writing our own music and stuff, we played covers. You know, we, we, we played bars, beer bars, beer gardens, parties, keg parties. Mm. They were very popular down here in Florida. They, you know, you just go to a big, you know, field, and they'd have keg parties. Some of them need, or they had electricity at some of them. And they would have, we had one party in my backyard where the police came. We had one party. We were expecting about 200 people, and 1,200 people showed up. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and so did uh, the police. <laughs> you know, How old they were showed you guys up then? as well. Oh, okay. Chris was probably 16. Oh, wow. I was like, uh, yeah, I was like, yeah, 19, 20, something like that. He might have been a little younger, maybe 15. I know I was ni- I was 19. I wasn't even 20 yet. But While we're on that a little age bracket there, I know uh, you said you were kicked out of high school. So was that metal related or was that other stuff going on? Oh, I was kicked out because I lit the vice principal on fire. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'll do yeah. it. Yeah, that, that'll do it every time. He caught me smoking on the uh, retaining wall on the on the parking lot near the school. It was really windy day. Uh, we had a hurricane coming in, and he caught me smoking. And he just said, "Get rid of that cigarette." And I I flipped I flicked the cigarette, but the wind caught it and blew it back, and it went down his shirt. He was wearing one of those like silk disco type shirts from back in the day, mm-hmm. and it. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> oh, that was so. That was bad. No, <laughs> that uh, that'll definitely do it. So, uh, was the cover yep. band was that was that Avatar that ultimately became Sabotage? No, no, that's the cover band was Metropolis, which eventually Chris and me, and Chris and I left that band and and uh, started Avatar or Tower, and then Avatar and Avatar turned into Sabotage. I wanted to ask you specifically. Uh, about Hall of the Mountain King in 87, John. How how long after that album release did you guys, you know, realize that you had something, that you kind of hit the jackpot there? Yeah, well, the, the big shocking thing to us was we actually had a video on MTV. That's when we knew something something was going on, and, and the sales were really good because it, it, we were being promoted. You could, be, you could put the greatest record in the world out. If you don't have any promotion, nobody's going to buy it because nobody knows about it. Yeah, we were just, we started, it just started happening slow. But then when the Mountain King video came out, then we got the, the tour with Ronnie Dio and Megadeth, and there was an arena tour, which, I mean, I we've never put, thought of playing in a sports arena before. You know, all of a sudden we're playing in front of 15,000 people every night. You know, the first night we played, I was so nervous. I threw up before we went on. You know, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I was, (laughs) you know, that tour was really good for us as far as getting the word out, the name out. While you're talking about being on stage and nervous, what was your very first time on stage? Like, if you remember that, were you nervous? Did you ever have stage fright or anything like that? Yeah, the very first time I played on stage was at a boys club in Escondido, California, where I got electrocuted. I had my guitar. I was playing guitar then, and I was also singing. And we opened up the show with War Picks. And we went, made it through the whole intro, and then when it goes, and he starts singing, General, I, I accidentally grabbed the microphone with my hand why I still had my hand on the guitar strings. And that was it. Show over. <laughs> well, yeah. That's a good first time. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, it lasted a lot, as long as the intro for War Pigs is. That's how, how, how long the first show I ever did lasted. <laughs> so how far along the way, as you guys are growing up, did you and Chris start to shift into your, you know, your respective roles with you on vocals and him taking the guitar role? Well, when I went to see California Jam, you know, I, me and my friend, uh, a friend of mine called Squid, okay, <laughs> uh, we, we, we lied to our parents and told them we were going up in the mountains to go camping for the weekend, which we just took our camping gear and stuffed it in a cave up there and went down the other side of the mountain and got on a bus to uh, Ontario, the Ontario Motor Speedway. And, and when I left, I let Chris ask me if he could if he could play my guitar and stuff. And I said, sure. So I left, went to California Jam, came back, and there's Chris in the garage playing this guitar solo for Smoke on the Water. Like, no for no perfect. <laughs> uh, so it was just kind of like, I was like, well, here, you play guitar now. I'm going <laughs> to you know, play something else. And that's how it started. You know, Chris didn't know guitar scales or shit like that at all he he played all his solos where he played by ear and he was so fast that if he hit a wrong note he would he would know that it was wrong and bend the string into tune before the audience could hear that he was playing a wrong note that's how quick he was he was he was a exceptional music was in his soul you know Mm -hmm. Um, he didn't he didn't take any guitar lessons I didn't take any guitar lessons or keyboard lessons. My dad showed me like the major chords on a keyboard, and my br- our older brother showed us like on the guitar showed us like an A chord and an E chord and a G and a D and a C and an F. That was it. That's uh, that was our our lessons. Right. And we learned mainly from you know playing to records. Chris had uh, his staple of he called them his practice albums that he would just play to. And, you know, he just kept getting better and better and better. You know, it started with uh, Deep Purple and, and Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, the first one with, uh, you know, the first album that came out with uh, Man on a Silver Mountain on it. Mm-hmm. 
and Black Sabbath. And he would play the Sabbath records and UFO Obsession album was a mainstay, one of Chris's main guitar practice albums. And uh, then, you know, Eddie Van Halen came out. And then, you know, he like, loved Eddie. He loved Randy Rhodes. And uh, he used to play to their stuff like crazy, you know. And uh, he, I was, he, would, he would practice like three hours a day, you know, just playing to the record. He played the whole album. He didn't just play to one song. You know, he played every you know, wow. fucking album. I, I learned to sing. You know, my main influence was the Beatles. I loved the, I loved their, I learned to sing by listening to the Beatles and singing along. Then I saw Ozzy and uh, yeah, that was it. It was all over from that point on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love Ronnie. You know, I miss Ronnie a lot. He, he was great and he was very nice to me. I missed him a lot. You know, he was a big influence. Freddie Mercury was a huge influence. You know, those are, those are my main guys. And Klaus Mine from Scorpions was oh, yeah. a huge influence as well. It's funny that you mentioned that you and your brother are mostly self-taught because literally just the other day I was speaking with Marty Friedman and uh, he was saying how how he sort of found his own originality was stepping away from following your teacher because they're really only showing you what they know and that he thinks being mostly right. self-taught is where he found his sound. Is that sound about That's, right? I you? think that I would say the same thing about Chris. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We were never interested in, in, in sitting down and taking lessons. You know, I, I, I heard an interview once with, uh, you know, Paul McCartney, and he was talking about that. And he said that, you know, none of the Beatles could read music. And I was like, well, if they didn't need lessons, they, they didn't do too fucking bad, all right? All right, <laughs> right, right. You know. <laughs> exactly. You, know. <laughs> you mentioned that uh, that tour with Megadeth that you went on with uh, Megadeth and Dio. What was ultimately, you said you had some issues on that tour with Mustaine. Like, what, what was kind of going on with you guys? Oh, we were just too fucked up all the time. That was, uh, that was yeah. a, you know, we had a lot of issues. You know, some of them were, were just stupid and you know you do stupid shit when you're fucked up you know i used to like for instance i used to break into their dressing room and, and why uh they were on stage and i would steal his vodka <laughs> you know he, he'd come running in, i hey man he stole my fucking vodka again <laughs> <laughs> shit like that you know um yeah we just you know you, you gotta look at it like we were kids young being then, kids you know, you know? yeah, yeah. In our 20s, yeah. And we were, you know, the one thing that happens to people that they don't understand is the, the job that you do is people pushing stuff at you all the time for free, you know. Yeah. And you just, you, you think you're Superman when you're 22, you know, and you quickly realize that you're not. <laughs> Indeed. You know. So I mean, I love Dave. I love Mustaine. He's a great, he's a great guy. We had some issues, but... It wasn't anything that, you know, that two friends who were fucked up and just disagreed on something. You know, that's yeah. what it was like, you know. Yeah, just kids being kids. <laughs> yeah. So was it after that, not long after that tour specifically, that you decided that you needed, that you checked yourself into rehab? Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> you tour with Dave Mustaine and can make it without going to rehab. You're in good shape. But, yeah, um I think actually, I think Dave went into rehab as well after that tour. You know, we were just oh man, it was it was ugly. Okay, that's all I could say is people think they can drink. Well, I'll tell you what, man, I was drinking a bottle of vodka a day. All right, doing an eight ball of cocaine a day. You know, that's what it was like. It was just I don't think I I don't think there were one day went by on that tour, which was a long tour. I don't think one day went by that we didn't drink and do drugs. It's just the rock and roll lifestyle just, bam, hit you in the face, and there's no turning back. Yeah. You know, and, and you end up learning your lesson the hard way. Was that the first time that you were exposed to that sort of thing on that level? Oh, on that level, oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, I had smoked, smoked pot before, but I'd never done anything else, and I, I would drink a little bit you know, before that, but, ooh, <laughs> you know, you go in the dressing room every day and there's a bottle of vodka. When you start stealing the, the other band's vodka because you already drank yours, eh, you might, you might have a problem there. 
you know, you leave rehab and you said, you know, you sort of sabotage, shifted to a more progressive style. Was that intentional on your part or did you just write them that way naturally? Yeah, it just came out that way. Like uh, the Gutter Ballet album was the first thing we did when I got out of rehab. You know, Paul had this idea of doing a rock opera and Chris and I shot it down. So we, we compromised and he said, well, can we just do a couple songs in in a in, in in a rock I have this idea and I just wanna I just wanna, you know, dip your toe in the water. And those songs became um Gutter Ballet, Temptation Revelation and When the Crowds Are Gone. That was our sort of uh dipping the toe in the water mm-hmm. of of that type of, you know, piano based, you know, more queenish sure stuff like that. But there was a lot of songs on that album that were definitely drug related, you know, um and, and and definitely like uh, you know he hated the Thorazine Shuffle because when I was in rehab I wrote the Thorazine Shuffle while I was in rehab because uh, they would line up for their medicine all right and mm. they would get this, their medications and they would walk back down to the quad area and they never really picked their feet up off the ground they were so fucked up on whatever they they were giving them I call, and I said they they don't walk they just kind of shuffle. And I found out that the drugs that they, the, the shufflers, we called them, were taken was Thorzine. Bam, Thorzine, wow, that's a cool name. Oh, Thorzine the Shuffle. And if you listen to the words on that, it's all about, you know, every day at half past four, they push my food through the door, you know, all that stuff. And then we're doing the, all do the Thorzine Shuffle. Paul hated that song. He, uh, another one was um, Mentally Yours. You know, uh, th- those were two. Th- Paul wanted to get away from that, so he was kind of pushing us towards that uh, direction, which was going to become streets. Mm. And uh, I'm glad he did. So we, I figured, we had done enough. You know, sirens, dungeons, power of the night. I don't even count a fight for the nightmare as a fight for the nightmare had like two sabotage songs on, it, and the rest were songs that I wrote for other people. But you know, the managers. Uh, the managers we had were I, we used to call them one guy's name was Smith and the other guy's name was uh, Starwood so Johnny nicknamed them Smith and Wesson <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and we, we you know uh, they were our managers up until uh, up until Mountain King and they they ripped us off for almost two million dollars holy shit yeah it almost broke the band up if we wouldn't have met Paul when we met Paul there would have been no Mountain King album, no gutter, none of that. He, you know, he came in, he goes, what, what, we're, I told him, we told him, we, he took us to dinner, me and my brother, and we told him, we said, well, we're, we're done. You know, we can't pay our bills, we have no money, and, and he's like, Paul's like, no, 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 you're not done. I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you guys $50,000. I want you to get all the equipment you need, this, that, and, and a new rehearsal place and pay your bills for a year. And I'm looking at my brother going, who is this guy? <laughs> is this is this crazy? And Chris kicks me under the table. He's like, shut up, you fucking idiot. <laughs> so he kept us. Yeah, so we did it, you know. And, we, and then we asked, all he asked for was that he could write and co-produce the album with us. Not a bad price. And then, then that's, no, 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 no. It was really good. I mean, you know, it's still my favorite sabotage album is Streets because the three of us were all working at our at our peak on that album. And I think Chris's guitar playing was sensational. I thought the vocals and stuff were were the best I've ever done, and it was a great album. You know, um, I'm, uh, it sucks that it didn't get promoted by Atlantic like it should have, but whatever. You know such as a bridge under the water. Or... So it was the Atlantic that screwed you guys out of the $2 million. Oh, they, they knew what happened. They were ag- angry as well because, you know, we had we had still had to recoup. You know, they still had money to recoup. If the band was broke up, they're basically fucked. <laughs> yeah. They're not going to recoup any money. So they were pissed off about it. It's actually a, 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 a guy that worked at Atlantic turned us on to a music attorney that was the guy who ended up getting us out of everything. And Paul knew him. Paul knew him as well. So, yeah, it was, it was a nightmare. That whole Fight for the Rock 
Ear, uh, you know, era before Malenkin was a fucking nightmare. Everything, you know, you found out we got ripped off, you know, uh, the record sucked, is our opinion, but it was just a real, it was a really bad time in our lives. Speaking on that, it's got to be a terrible situation as a band where you don't enjoy the music or think the music you're making is up to par, but still you have to release it because it's out of your hands. Right, that's true. I mean, uh, we didn't know that the, the managers who were ripping us off, we, we wrote the song Hide and the song The Edge of Midnight and the title track, Fight for the Rock. And we, we those are sabotage songs. I had submitted a demo tape of all these other songs to the management because they were going to uh, shop them around to some other artists like John Waite, people like that. All of a sudden, they're going like, well, you guys are going to do these songs. We're like, what? That's not, that's not sabotage. Oh, man, you want to make money or what? You know, you got you know, you to get more commercial, you know? Mm. I, we want to turn you guys into the next journey. All right. That was their, their, their thing. Mm. And so they basically forced us to do the majority of the music on, on um, Fight for the Rock. So, John, after Chris's death, you've already you said in plenty of other interviews, a sabotage was basically over. Did you intend to stop at Handful of Rain altogether? Um, no, because of a, a conversation I had with my brother. Um, I, I recalled it was on the back of a tour bus in the back lounge. And it was when I was in really bad shape and stuff, I was I was everyone thought I was going to die. Right. You know. And I was having a talk with Chris, and I said, "Look, man, if something happens to me, don't don't break the band up. Get get another singer. Just keep going." And he turned around and looked at me, "Dude, if I die, don't you fucking break up the band." So that we made that it was like a agreement we had. You know, a handful of rain was a very difficult album for me. I had no band. You know, the, the guys. It was too soon for the guys. Johnny and, and Wackles. I basically, uh, we, Zach either. He, he didn't want it. Zach came in at the end. We got, Paul convinced Zach to come in and do the vocals. My voice was still healing, but I had to play. I played all the drums, all the bass, all the keyboards, and all the guitars, rhythm guitar and some lead guitar, until there was a couple things I couldn't play. So I called Alex Skolnick and asked him to come if he would come and help out. And he said, sure, man, because he loved Chris as well. So uh, Alex came and he played solos on, um, I don't know, four or five songs. I don't really remember now. But uh, so he helped out and that was really nice of him. But, you know, and then after a handful of rain, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, we, we were thinking about the de next album, Dead Winter Dead. Mm -hmm. Paul had a whole concept for it. And that's when we, we got Al Petrelli to join, and then Chris Caffrey came back, and uh, Johnny came back. The only one who didn't come, Zach was back. Wackles didn't want to come back at that time, so we got Jeff Plate. And that lineup has pretty much stayed intact, you know, um, even though on Poets, Zach wasn't on Poets, but everybody else was, even though Al had left the band, he still played on the album. For Dead, Winter, Dead, that's when... Uh... Not long after that, I guess, Paul approaches you about Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Yeah. Got a phone call at 4 o'clock in the morning from Paul saying, John, I have this great idea because Dead Winter Dead was out and that song, 1224, was charting, okay? But we couldn't get all... Every radio station that played it by Sabotage got great response, but a lot of the major stations wouldn't play it because of the name, because it was a, a band called Sabotage. And they were all like, oh, the heavy metal band from the 80s, fuck them. Well, what we did, we knew it was a hit. And we did, the next year, we did all, you know, he said, we're gonna do this thing called Trans-Siberian Orchestra, and we're gonna write an album around that song, which we did. Sent the same single, to all the radio stations that turned it down, it became number one most requested on over 500 radio stations. It sold like 20 million, but they wouldn't play it when it was released as Sabotage just because of the name. 
And, you know, obviously, you know, Trans-Siberian Orchestra is holiday-themed. What did you think about that shift going forward? Did you even care? Were you a big – was Christmas a big part of your life growing up? Oh, well, definitely it was. And, and, oh, well, I mean, I, I'm not, not going to lie and say that I absolutely adore Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Right. Trans-Siberian Orchestra, for me, became a job mm-hmm. where I was making money. I made more money off of one record with Trans-Siberian Orchestra – than I made in my entire career with Sabotage, okay? Yeah. So it's like a, a guy, you know, you know hey, uh, I know you're only making $100 a week. I know you love your job, but we'll pay you $2,000 a week if you come and do this. And if you have a wife and kids, what are you going to tell me you're going to stick with the job that only is paying you $100 a week? Hell no. Fuck no, you're not. <laughs> you're going to go where you, you know, you got a family to take care of, right. you know? And, and I get I get kind of pissed off about it because well, I hear a lot of sabotage people go, oh, you broke up sin. So I said, well, where were you guys when we needed you? Mm, amen. You know, you know why, why Why weren't you all buying any albums? You know, if Sabotage had gold and platinum albums like Trans-Siberian Orchestra has, we would never have broke up. Preach. But if you think about it, Trans-Siberian Orchestra is Sabotage. You know, all the guys from Sabotage play in Trans-Siberian Orchestra. You know, it's it's basically the same. It, it's sabotage in suits, is what I call it. It's classy. Suitage. <laughs> or sabotux. <laughs> you know. But, you know, it's like we gave a lot of time to sabotage from 1983 until 2001. That's a long time. And we were trying to get, you know, and it just never broke into the big into the big time and we were spending way more money than we were making right you know i mean jesus christ trans-siberian orchestra sells out sports arenas two shows a day yeah to this day yeah last time metallica came here to tampa they barely sold out the amway arena we played that we sold both shows out you know, he played in front of 30,000 people in Tampa. Right. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's crazy. It's crazy how popular that, that shit is. Yeah, I'm proud of the stuff. I wrote a lot of that stuff. So for me, it's like, I'm like, well, you know, I like that song. <laughs> There's some songs I don't like, but, you know, so nobody just- likes everything. Exactly. Specifically with Trans-Siberian Orchestra, a lot of it is about you guys have elaborate live shows, crazy stuff going on. What are some of the uh, just some of the struggles of putting together a show like that and making everything go off without a hitch? Oh, it's a fucking nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nightmare. Well, we go to Omaha every year on Halloween, and we rehearse in or we rented a whole arena, the Mid-America Center, we rent it out for two weeks, and we we rehearse the show and run the show. And you remember, we have two bands, so I have to sit there. I supervise everything that's going on. I get there at ten o'clock in the morning, and mu- usually the music starts up around eleven. And the uh, East Coast band plays, then the West Coast band plays, then the East Coast band plays, then the West Coast. I watch that fucking show four times a day. For 23 days in a row. Jeez. <laughs> <Oof>. <laughs> yeah, but you know that that it, 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 you know I change I I'll, we're changing shit all the way up until the last day of rehearsal, trying to make it better, and it gets tougher because you you know you have to outdo last year's show. Yeah. You know, and, and that's getting harder to do now. You know, like I I'm I I have to leave for Omaha at the end of October. And I'll, I'll, oh, I hate I hate Omaha first of all because there's nothing to do up there. There's nothing but but uh, cornfields, <laughs> and uh, and and I hate that those hours. You know, ten in the morning until I usually get back to my hotel uh, between two and three in the morning, and then I have to get up at nine and be back at the arena by ten. Now you do that twenty three days in a row. There's no days off either. You know, there's no like, oh, we're going to take Sunday off. There's none of that shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no such creature as a day off. So. so how many people would you say are involved in the operation, you know, top to bottom? Never mind the bands. You mean the production? Yeah, just producing, producing a single show. Uh, 
I'd say 200. Yeah, and I have to pay them all too. So <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you since you just mentioned it a few minutes ago. You know, how did you react yourself when uh, you get that first Trans Siberian Orchestra check? You know, you said like you said it was way more than you ever made in sabotage. Did you shit your pants? I thought they. I thought they made a mistake. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, there's too many zeros here. I swear to God, I thought, I thought they made I thought they made a mistake. I said, no, they didn't make a mistake. I said, dude, this is over, this is a six-figure number. That's... Well, would you rather it be a five-figure number? No, 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 it's all right. <laughs> That's great. John, What is what would you say is the best musical advice you've received in your career, and who gave it to you? I don't know. I, well, the guy, Paul gave me a grand piano, the one that's at our studio in Tampa. Mm-hmm. So I guess that, cause that, that's the last instrument that Paul, me, and Chris wrote a song together on, which was All That I Bleed. So that means a lot. It's had special meaning for me. I guess it would have to be that black nine-foot uh, Yamaha grand piano. If 60-year-old John could go back and give 19-year-old John some advice, what would you tell him? Smarten up, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I go back and tell myself the same thing. So, uh, to technically speaking, you know, from a technical perspective here, what would you say is the most difficult song you've created or composed? Ooh, probably Morphine Child. Just a bastard to play. You know, it. that was difficult. That was very difficult to record, and it took uh, took a couple months to write because we kept changing. I, I was I wasn't happy with it, so I kept re- rewriting parts. And then I'd play them for Paul, and he would go, oh, that's great. No, the other one was better. No, that's better. So we went back and forth with that. And uh, recording was very difficult because I I wasn't happy with the vocal until until we finally got it right. Uh, It was a very difficult song to sing. When it comes to music specifically, you know, how do ideas usually start for you? Is it a riff, maybe a melody, a lyric? Does one happen more than the other? No, uh, usually it's a riff. And sometimes it's a melody, but most of the time it's it's either on guitar or on piano where I'll come up with like a chord progression or something that I think is, is good. But, you know, you write, sometimes I write while I'm driving mm. or, you know, I'll, I'll just be, something will just come into your head and you, you know, I, I always have a, a, a dictaphone with me in case I come up with something, I could just, I just hit the button and it records it. Because a lot of times things will come into your mind, and then if you get distracted, you'll lose it. Right, definitely. Have you ever been inspired musically by a non-musical source? Maybe a painting or a movie or a story or anything like that? Uh, A story. Actually, a couple. Like Sirens was based on The Odyssey, book The Odyssey. Hounds was based on the movie, uh, the Sherlock Holmes movie, Hound of the Baskervilles. So some, yeah, sometimes there's a couple other songs I can't really remember what they were based around. Well, I mean, Mountain King was, you know, we had the original Krieg, the dun 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 you know, mm-hmm. and that inspired the rest of the song uh, and the lyrics. So, you know, it, 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 shit happens all sometimes. You know, like I, I had nightmares. A lot of songs were uh, inspired by nightmares I had. Sitch Beneath the Surface was a nightmare. Wow. Uh, Beyond the Doors of the Dark was a nightmare. Uh, Power of the Night, the song Unusual was about a nightmare. I had a lot of nightmares. <laughs> and I'm still having them to this day. Yeah, I was going to ask you, does that still happen? When's the last time you had a uh, song based uh, off a nightmare? Not for a while. I think the last one was Hounds. So uh, another, this is something else I'd like to ask everybody, John, not to keep you all day here, but uh, have you ever had an experience you would consider supernatural or paranormal? Oh, God. Thousands of them. Well, the the song Unusual was on Power of the Night. The whole Power of the Night recording sessions were haunted, okay, in a place called Bearsville, New York, which is right next to Woodstock. And... We recorded at Bearsville Studio, and uh, they had a rehearsal facility at the bottom of the mountains called Turtle Creek with a rehearsal barn that had like a a four-track in it and stuff. I stayed, I actually stayed in the room that Jimi Hendrix slept in, and uh, so much shit happened at that place. We would 
you know, windows would open up in the middle of the night and you'd wake up freezing cold because it was in the dead of winter. Freezing cold with snow coming in. I, I would find my shoes hidden underneath the bed. You'd walk by the bathroom and you'd hear a buzzing and you'd open up the door and a blow dryer would be rattling around in the sink, turned on. A painting, a painting that we thought was a painting of a, a, a young girl in the middle of a field of daisies and all kinds of holding a big bouquet turned into an old lady holding a bunch of dead roses. Holy shit. And then it turned back to, then it turned back to the little girl again. A lot of weird shit up in that area, man. You know, we had a door, the door that, that you walk in uh, up on top of the, where to get into the studio, it had three locks on it. And then you would go in this, this room, we had a couple bedrooms, it had a pool table in the kitchen, and you'd go down these spiral staircase to the studio. Well, we're down in the studio recording, and we, we're finished for the night, and... We go upstairs, the spiral staircase, and the door is wide open, and there's snow inside the door, okay? The only way you could open that door is from the inside, which means you would have to walk right by us in the studio control room and go up the spiral stairs to get into that apartment thing that was on top. So somehow three locks and yeah, and then, you know, and three locks, chain lock and everything. And the thing was wide open. Damn. That was it for me. I'm like, I'm not staying here anymore. I'm going to go down into town and stay with Max Norman. <laughs> Safe to say that was the last time y'all recorded an album there. <laughs> yep. I, I'm not going back there, man. <laughs> Where was that again? Bearsville. Bearsville. Gotcha. Bearsville, New York. Power of the Night album, you said? Yes. That's Very right. haunted. I know you you got a new Trans Siberian Orchestra tour coming out, and you just said you know you guys like to mix it up every year. So how's that go? How's the mixing up going for you now? We got we know what we're gonna do. We're gonna do the uh, Christmas Abbey this year because it's twenty five years. So we're gonna be featuring that album. You know, uh, we we really don't get into the actual putting our heads together until October. Okay, so, and then we prepare everything during the first two or three weeks of October and get ready so when we get to Omaha, we're ready to go. This go around, are you taking, you know, more of the manager role or do you plan on playing any yourself live as well this time? Uh, no, I'm not doing, I let the business guys do the business. I'm, I'm involved with the talent, working with the bands, you know, doing the, you know, putting the stage show together, choreography, Working with the vocalists is my main thing, mm. and uh, so it's kind of like a producer type of uh, type of title. Since we lost Paul, I mean, you know, uh, it, a lot of that stuff got dumped on, got handed to me because I'm the only one who could do it. You know, me or well, Al Petrelli helps me a lot too. He's very, very important, and uh, Derek Whelan is also very important in that. It, it's kind of like they're the musical directors. Uh, Derek, the East Coast, Al, the West Coast. You know, we, we all work together on, on the stuff. There's no one one person who has a, a say-so. It's it's a group effort, totally. Got you, John. And I, like I said, not going to keep you all day here. So I guess just to put a bow on this chat here, what's on the horizon for you? Well, we were doing a new sabotage record until I fractured my spine. And so we have to put that off now until the first of the year. I slipped on a wet marble floor and I fractured my T7 vertebrae. It's very painful. I'm actually in a lot of pain right now, but I have to wear this uh, uh, this kind of like a harness vest support thing for four months. Sorry to hear that, man. I hope I hope you get the feeling better. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Like I said, I'm not going to keep you. That's all I got for you, John. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Nice to talk to you, too, man. Call anytime. Thank you so much, man. You take care of yourself. All right, you too, man. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. All right, folks, that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed that chat with John. As always, thanks for listening, and we'll see you back next time. Monsters, Madness, and Magic. (laughs) Ha <laughs> ha
Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts.